Moonshine Bandits. Yeah. Hi. Welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. Thanks for having us. The very first question I have been starting with is, what was the role of music in your childhoods? Ah, good question. Um, I actually sang in church. My dad was a preacher. My mom led choir. And um, the earliest I can remember me singing is in Texas. And um, I used to always be up on stage singing for whatever reason. All the gospel songs. We were Pentecostal, so we were in all those crazy kind of get everybody's feet stomping and clapping kind of music. And um, that's kind of where I first started singing. Ever since I was a little kid, I was singing. Mm -hmm. so. My life is a little different. I grew up with a big Italian family, and every weekend was a party, and <laughs> people had wooden spoons out, and they were singing whether they sucked or whether they sang good, and it's just how it was. You grabbed a microphone. And got up there and everybody just had a good time and I always loved music since I was a kid and high school is when I s started messing around with uh, rapping and stuff with him at uh, country parties, cake parties and then right after high school it just kind of kept going. Started off as fun and yeah. Yeah, kind of developed into... Connect a Texas Pentecostal Church <laughs> with... What you're doing now? What what was the what was the missing link? What happened in between? Life. <laughs> Meeting. Went him. from uh, Texas. My my dad was a preacher in Texas, and he moved us to. We went to Mississippi, where he became another preacher down there, and um, lived there for a while as a kid, years, and uh, got back out to California, and basically went to high school out in California, and that's when I kind of met you know, Tex and. I was best friends with his cousin and whatnot. I kind of just linked us all into basketball together, you know, and sports and partying and everything you do when your, you know, hormones are going crazy at 17, 18, and, you know, beer tasted really good, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Don't show this to mom. Actually, she caught me several times. Oh, okay. So, so she knows. Sorry. We can leave it in. Yeah, you can. <laughs> I'm an old man now, so. And the... She still won't go to your shows, though. She came to one, really? two. She just came to two shows. She came to our very first show that we did in our hometown, and she was like, oh, that's what you do? <laughs> my parents, shoot, they, <laughs> they try to go to every show. They camp out. And my dad will be... Oh, that's awesome. We flew him out to uh, Texas, and he went to a few shows, but he just starts becoming a liability now. <laughs> I mean, he's just... He's kind of like us. A little too wild? Uh, yeah, and he's getting older. He can't do it, like... We try to do it, so he tries to keep up, but it's falling down, stuff like that. So. <laughs> the creation of, because one of the, the first things that in the new bio, almost the first sentence, um, refers to this is a new thing, or this is a different type of music that was, you guys were doing this 10 years ago, before it was cool, <laughs> before it was a thing. What brought that... What brought that on? What made you go, here's the music I like, here's other music I like, here's some more music I like, let's stick it all in a pot and blend it together. I don't think we ever sat down and said, hey, we need to mix country with hip-hop. I think we grew up listening to different types of music, and it was always organic to us to make, write, write songs. I mean, our content's always been about our surroundings. We grew up in yeah. Central Cali, which is known for farming and ag, and my uncle worked for John Deere. My grandfather farmed uh, seed and harvested beans. And your family grew up blue collar. And yeah, it, they did. They did that. I'm actually going to share a story that we were talking about the other day, um, which was something that we always forget about. But we had a buddy from high school. Uh, he's from Hawaii. Um, he was out one night, and we were messing around with music. We had already started making... I think we'd already did our first four song demo or maybe maybe we had six songs recorded or something like that. And we had, um, one of our songs was going. We had a producer send us some music to like check out and it was just the instrumental. And he was like, man, I hear this Johnny Cash song over that. And we're like, Johnny Cash, you hear that on this? And he's like, I hear that train of coming. It's rolling around the bend. And we heard that, and when he was just saying it, it was like, holy crap, that was awesome. It was so cool 
to hear that kind of yeah. style of sound. And we actually wound up doing this song called The Movement, which is basically a tribute to that per particular moment. And from that moment on, it kind of really changed the way we wrote our music and maybe recorded our music. It, it un maybe unconsciously changed it because we didn't really say, hey, we're going to go out and do a country beat or a rock beat or something like that. It just started coming out that way. But we are a product of our environment, like Tech said, mm -hmm. and agricultural and family and that kind of stuff. But musically, that was a moment, possibly the very first spark of the match. You know what I mean? Yeah. Before it caught fire. But what I'm interested in is that at that moment, nobody then quickly went to blow out the match. Like nobody went, well, we can't do that because that's not what radio plays. That wasn't yeah. a thing. That moment of spark yeah. was allowed to grow. What, do you know why, why you can do that? And other people are like, no, I have to conform. Uh, you know what, we, since day one, we've pretty much done it our way. I mean, we started off sending demos to every record label you could think of. And like I said, our lyrics and content were country influenced with hip hop beats put to that, those lyrics. We mailed them out, we put them together, we printed them on Kinko, sent them out, no callbacks. We'd try to get a call, we'd bug them on the phone. You know, our stuff was just getting thrown in the trash. And from that point on, we're just like, you know what? We'll just do it our way. We're not gonna worry about radio, we're not gonna worry about MTV. If that comes our way, of course it'd be a great thing. But then we just took that point on and we just went boom, boom, boom and just kept doing things our own way and expanding and doing the grassroots campaign and using social media. YouTube's been huge for us and reaching our fans that way. And I think we were able to build a loyal fan base from, from that. I mean, our fan base is really loyal. Yeah. Like if I had, we call them Shiner Nation, they're Shiners. And if I had 10 of them and asked them, will you guys steal that car for me? Eight of them will do it, and the other two will bail them out. That's, I mean, it's a true story. They have, there's thousands of tattoos. And yeah. 52-year-old guy just got Shiner Nation on his forehead. I think there's that's, also... That's dedication. That's there's a, also a little too much dedication. <laughs> that's amazing. There was also a moment, too, back in our early stages of our career, I mean, where we've had so many people tell us no and so many doors shut in our career it kind of made us hard, it hardened us up to become, you know, we want to do this on our own. But there was a moment when it was just Eminem and Bubba Sparks. Bubba Sparks had just came out. Me and Tex were sitting in Universal's office in L.A. And we were having a meeting and they were sitting there wanting to sign us. And had that deal been done, the Moonshine Bandits today probably wouldn't be the Moonshine Bandits today. And I'm glad that that deal didn't happen. Now, look back then, I was like, we were so bummed. Oh, we had this opportunity, and we had a, a representative there with us that possibly didn't know what he was doing. And I'm glad he didn't, because it forced us to take the dirt roads and the side roads and build this from a grassroots campaign, because I don't need radio, I don't need TV, and I got a fan base, and they're going to be there until we say we're done. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I try to instill in independent artists who have that drive that's like, I need a record deal, I need a publishing deal, that's all they can see, is, okay, you know, let's go work on that. But a very big part is, what are you doing for your career that doesn't depend on anybody else? Yeah. Um, so exactly that, that path that you guys took. And when, when that deal doesn't materialize, when that doesn't show up, what helps you still go forward? What What do you say to yourself to still go, well, they didn't believe in us, but we believe in us, so we're continuing. I think along the way, there's just been little goals that we've always had, and we meet that goal and then just keep going. That kind of helped us through times where the labels weren't picking us up. Oh, we've been, there's been times where we're, we've been completely at the very bottom, you know, dejected. But then something else would pop up, like a, yeah. like a licensing for a movie or something. Some would come yeah. our way, and we'd be like, "Ah, let's keep going." Or potentially a big song, or a show, or something show. big that would say, "Okay, well, we got this. Let's not worry about that deal no more. Let's keep going." Something would always pop yeah. up. I don't know. I guess we had our, 
Or in our support system around us. Yeah, yeah I mean, my um, wife wouldn't let us quit at all. I mean, me, yeah. me and him would fight, fight each other and not talk for a few weeks. And she'd be like, you know what? I got a lot <laughs> invested in this too now. Yeah. You guys ain't quitting on me, so. Yeah, she's uh, she's been there to help us out. She actually deserves more credit than <laughs> we're giving her right now, too, because... She deserves all. Nick, one of these days, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to get a Bahama vacation with me. <laughs> for a month. Or more. The Another thing I picked up out of that bio that I thought, oh, I want to know more about this, um, is a more technical thing. You, the, the Ira Dean song, I Earned It, is mentioned in there. And he said he kind of brought a slight difference in that it was more, it turned it from rap more into spoken word. Yeah. What is the difference between those two styles? Because for a lot of people, it might not sound, they might not understand it. Spoken word to them, all spoken word to them might be rap. Um, how would you explain that difference? A lot of it has to do with the rhythm and the way you're, uh, Recording your vocals with like more of a hip hop rhyme pattern is a little more up tempo versus spoken word. You're almost talking and rhyming, and it was actually really hard for me to go that route because I had never done it before. And when I was recording it, they were just like, "Man, it took me forever to get it down." But well, everyone was getting frustrated, but it's was completely frustrated. different. You know, it's completely different. Like the old cowboys that used to do it, it's just natural because they're not trying to go over the. The beat, like, like to the drums. When you rap and you go, you ride the wave of the beat. You ride the beat, and you play in different kind of uh, styles that you can do that. But the, like the the cowboys, they just they just speak their, they just talk, you know. And it, they didn't really have to follow the beat; it would just go over it. And then they come in on tempo, on rhythm, on the chorus, coming and singing and stuff. So, and um, I think the song turned out great. And Ira, he kind of opened up our eyes on. Hey, maybe a try a little bit something like this. It it might be it might fit you good. It was a challenge, but I think yeah. it turned out great. Yeah, it was. I mean, just the first time we met Ira was it was awesome. I don't know if you've ever had a chance mm -hmm. to meet him. He's a storyteller. <laughs> he's just super funny. And we wrote the first song with him, and uh, that was what top off the tank or something. Yeah. And then uh, from there, hit it off with him, and he's like, "Hey, come out to my ranch." So we went out there. And, Checked out all his stuff, and it was awesome. His house was like a museum. Yeah. And he had a story about his, the boy had Johnny Cash's guitar, and he found like a half-written song in it. <laughs> yeah. Funny. He called yeah. Johnny Cash up, and he was like, hey, man, you, I found this half-written song in here. And what did he say? Johnny said, was it worth the shit? <laughs> Is it worth the shit? And I <laughs> goes, yeah, it's a great song. And then Johnny said, well, finish the song. Then. We'll finish it. But yeah. he, never, he yeah. never finished the lyrics. He just framed them. That's pretty cool. But yeah, he was a great guy to work with. Noah Gordon's another guy we worked with too. What other? Because um, in a couple of in the bio, there's a couple of people where um, they're not mentioned by name. I don't think that it says like you worked with a couple of different songwriters that you hadn't worked with before. What yeah. were some of the things out of that that you thought? Like with Ira, you know that delivery. Like this is yeah. a new. Well, there's thing. So when we came, we came to Nashville. It was the very first time we ever did this, and this is based. Our manager was like, "You should come out and try this approach. It's just a different approach to try to gain ideas and maybe try a different style of creativity with your writing." And we got to work with Django Walker. That's Jerry Jeff Walker's son, you mm -hmm. know, um, famous Texas country, and he was a very cool dude. And we got to work with some of Zavitson, Zavitson, yeah, Jeffrey, Jeffrey East over at Zavitson Music, and uh, a couple of guys that were really good and just they were very good and they're very talented songwriters and we uh <clears throat> work with them and stuff and then the songs just didn't fit for this project as we'll probably wind up using the songs and the concepts down the road maybe for the next project but for this particular project we worked with we used the two Ira songs and the song with Noah Gordon but it was a cool uh, opportunity experience, for us to, yeah it's definitely outside of what we're used to doing so yeah us flying out there and looking like this, walking into these writing sessions, and, it's like you know, you never know how people are going to react. To, and to maybe they don't. Maybe those guys don't really work with guys that are kind of quote unquote in our genre. And so you know, I don't know if they really would know how to particularly write a song right. the way we would write songs. So yeah. and it's not a knock on them. It's just like you're kind of filling each other out for the first hour. 
Yeah. And just getting to know each other, and then you kind of start working on some stuff. But yeah. It was cool. I would like to draw a connection, if I may, between American Band and Albert Einstein. <laughs> All right, that's good. Uh, I got it. They both start with you're A. Like, ah, wait, um, I was listening to that, and the there's a quote from Albert Einstein that says, "I am thankful for all those who said no to me. It is because of them that I am doing it myself." Hmm. And I thought, uh -huh. you also said imagination <laughs> is more important than knowledge. Einstein. I don't know. You can handle he that. He said a question. lot of things. <laughs> you know? Rogers also two people with imagination land, dude. There's a lot of things, dude. It's your man. All the guys are over there. But it's imagination it, we, land. One guy. We sort of touched on that before. The the you know being thankful for for the no, being thankful for yeah. it not happening. Um, how? Because I was I was listening to to some of the lyrics, and it's for me, it's. It's true. They're pretty. Yeah, they're they're, they're just, true. It's what just this is what's true. going on and naming yes. names and Ryan Seacrest signed us to a television show. This deal. is what happened. It didn't work. Twelve months we yeah. locked into that. So, but now you're probably looking See, back on that, going, "Wow, we're so glad that didn't happen." Yeah, yeah they probably would have owned everything. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I mean, there's a in CMA Fest, We played hard rock there, and they said they'll never have us back because we were a little. Too crazy, and then uh, Sturgis, Easy Rider, which we thought would be one of the craziest places to ever play. We played Easy Riders, and they're like, "No, you guys can't tell your fans to jump off the second story balcony because they did it." <laughs> they're like, "You're not coming back." Well, it's crazy too about like Sturgis is like one of those places that we had it built up in our mind that this is going to be the rowdiest, craziest bike show, and we've been playing around a lot of bikers. A lot of bikers support us. And the, Different clubs, not just the one percenters. They're out in full force at a lot of our shows. So we figured once we got to Sturgis, it would be crazy. And little did we know, you're walking down the street and there's families walking their five year olds on the block. With <laughs> well, your brother brought it his family. He did. <laughs> when he was passing through, so I told him to stop on in. But I mean, it was family. It was like Disneyland. But this year, we're, we're so, back. We're playing five shows in a row at Glencoe. So it's the 75th anniversary. Million people are supposed to be there, so it's gonna be crazy. awesome. Very good. Because that touches on my next question: the genre or blending of genres that you pioneered suddenly became a thing, and everybody was doing it, and it became a popular thing with people copying it. Maybe not quite, you know, for the reason that they genuinely, creatively wanted to do that. Um, how did that feel to you to see that? And you could be as honest as you want to be until he stops you. Uh, how did that feel Should to you to, say see, <laughs> to see the that first of all becoming popular, but then also a little bit maybe being subverted into what them becoming more popular and taking more fame than the guys mm -hmm. that actually really kind of started. No, yeah, doing it? maybe, but also seeing that authenticity go away a little. These aren't people who did that because they genuinely wanted to do that. They did that because it was. Popular. I mean, actually, it's probably a, they saw something that was working in the grassroots, and they took it, and they had millions of dollars to put behind them, and they ran with it. And you know what? That's continued to open up doors. So for guys like us, we're happy. You know what I mean? The spotlight's finally going to come on guys like us. And people I mean, like I think us. you got it. I mean, you got to think. There's, we got 20 million YouTube views. And we're doing that without a huge radio campaign, no TV support. So naturally, if you got a guys that are already successful and have huge radio budgets, they're going to see that. You can't tell me they're not looking. Mm -hmm. They're going to see that, and they're going to adapt. And you know, they might toss a few songs out that have similarities to us or similar styles, I would say. But uh, I mean, it just is what it is. Sometimes it can be a touchy subject, but other times, if you sit back and look, though, you kind of you got to look that it is kind of it is kind of eye opening that you know big nat big people in Nashville, old Nashville, whoever runs radio, whoever runs this whole thing, I don't know, but whoever they are, they know that there's a movement going on. There's they can't ignore it. it. There's mm -hmm. a market for it. They can't ignore it. You got so, guys like Colt and the Lax. Lax album was number three, I think. But, 
Number three on Billboard, mm -hmm. and I mean, they don't even get mentioned on the TV shows. It's crazy. They're selling, yeah. what, 14,000 records their first week, and you got guys that are spending hundreds of thousands on radio that aren't even doing that. Mm -hmm. So there's a market for it. it. Just Sooner or later, there'll probably be a radio platform for it. They're probably We won't see it, but guys that are younger that are doing what we're doing will probably benefit from it. And it was like something mm -hmm. yesterday. We were at a video shoot with some of our peers in the business, you know, guys that are kind of in this quote unquote genre. They throw us all they throw us all in this genre, you know, and it's all different kinds of music, but they're like, you know, it's pretty much they said too, it's like, you know, we're here to pave the way for the future of the future of the, the business. And yeah, you know, if we never see that type of fame and fortune, whatever, that's fine by me. As long as the Speak people that yourself, do see it, man, I well, know. I do, I do. <laughs> You know, but as long as whenever the kids are winning these winning the awards down the road, it'd be nice for them to say, you know, thanks to guys like Moonshine Bandits or so and so to yeah. you know, help pave the way because we have been. We've been paving it for yeah, talking like we're old, real old, man. Uh, we've only been in the game two years. <laughs> yeah. Just got out just got out of college. Google us, dude. A lot of miles we are in these eyes, a lot of miles. But um, that's and an APA, interesting just point. Just a mile, sweetheart. Because <laughs> that is striving for meaning rather than just success. So that I think that's a very important meaning. distinction. Yeah, for yeah. that that career to have meaning rather exactly. than that career to merely be successful, which is nice. Yeah. But that's a far more value. Yeah. To be able to put it in that context. Yeah. One day they'll give out a mohawk award. <laughs> Instead of the, I don't know what are the CMAs now, yeah, like some sort of glass <laughs> you're, sculptures you're, you're they get could my be head. in. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like the shock top logo. Yes. <laughs> Here's a beer, we got those beer tabs. Here you go. Well, one thing that I, I've always found interesting is this is not my thing. Like, I listen to James Taylor and Matt Nathanson, and that's yeah. my thing. Um, like we have a James Taylor story. What I yeah, found. We do have a James Taylor story. <laughs> this. Our Good. bus was originally commissioned by James Taylor, the bus that we own today. Nice. And he changed the interior of it, and it's still to his... To his specifications. Spec in his bunk. I'm sleeping in his bunk. That is very cool. That is a very cool Let's see if we can find some of his hair or something bring you. <laughs> That's <laughs> creepy. <laughs> Would you keep it, though? That's no. the creepier... Come on. <laughs> Here's James Taylor. I think I saw an old used. <laughs> But the, the point that I was going to make is not ever would my reaction then be, well, it's not what I listen to, therefore it shouldn't exist, which is what I hear a lot. And you'll have these, you know, especially on the internet, people will have these rants about Colt or yourselves or other people, and it's, this is terrible, and oh my God, this shouldn't exist. And I'm, Who, what? Just we don't listen to We have a huge fan. I can't remember what website he's with, but I love the guy. Because he's brutally honest. <laughs> Saving country. Is that the guy? Yeah, he loves us. Hi, buddy. <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> when I see you, I'll put say a, hello. Put a little link. But to me, I don't. I don't understand <laughs> that. California. It's, that's yeah, to it's me crazy. Is, is if you if you don't like something, there's, there's a certain genre of music that you don't like. You don't like horror movies. Are you going to start writing articles? I really don't have the time movies? to like, go. I don't. I don't have that. the time to go on the internet and look for somebody's music that I don't like and tell them, hey. And I dedicate a website to music it. Yeah. And, I don't know. Well, that's it's the great thing about this country is you can be, you can have your freedom to express anything you want. No matter and what if, flag you want to put up. No matter anything. what flag you want to fly as your icon, you can still put it up because it's still America. America. <laughs> as your, whose arm was it? Yeah, yours? Uh, made in the USA. USA. <laughs> yeah. Does any kind of I'll use the word criticism, which in the response to that guy, I sometimes think goes over the line, but does any of that ever seep in? Ever. Even in tiny ways. I personally do not let it affect me, because I know if You're it's, a liar. You get pissed sometimes. No, me. No. You I'll get tell pissed you what, sometimes. Well, you want to punch him in the throat? Maybe <laughs> sometimes. But I'll tell you this. I will tell you this, that he's thinking about us. They're thinking about us, and you know what you're doing? You're turning other people on to us. Keep doing it. Because they turn up, they, 
they Google our name or they go to our website and they go, doing? and then they're like, wow, this ain't as bad as that guy portrayed. Or maybe they might be like, oh, this is the da a damn nation, you know. So mm -hmm. it is what it is. But if they weren't talking about us, then I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. And yeah. It, yeah. It's just, it is what it is. Any press is good. Press. A little upset, yeah. but I don't know. He's probably a guy that was in a rock band that never made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and because of that, no, I think it's I think that's normal. I think it's okay to have those moments where it it hurts. Yeah. Just as long as it then doesn't lead to actually making changes, I think well, it's okay I think it to like say if, like that's I'm not okay with this. But then, not, if it was know, a publication like Rolling Stone or something that came out and said I hate the Moonshine Bandits, I would be like, okay, that offended me. But some little punk see, I'd be proud to yeah. get my name in Rolling Stone. Oh, that's a good way to do it. Anyways, but I mean, we've dealt with that type of stuff our whole career. That's kind of how we've we've been the Americans underdog our whole career. So yeah. it's like some guy sitting behind a computer saying how shitty we are. It doesn't really bother me. Mm -hmm. Big deal. He's not he's not my demographic, obviously. That right there, I think that's really important is knowing who you're playing to, which yeah. also doesn't include me, and I know that. So it's yeah. and if if the as long as I can go in and listen to stuff like this and see the authenticity and the creativity, that's all I need. And whether that's, that's cool. I'm going to play that in my car when I'm driving, neither here nor there. Like, I just want that people doing something that's truly of themselves. That's um, cool. That, anybody, that I respect. Thank you. All right, all right a tell, a, tell a good road story. All right. This lady shows up to uh, one of our concerts in Santa Cruz, California. After the show, she bugs everybody to get her autograph. She comes over, our guys let her in. She goes, I want you to sign my ass. So we pull out our Sharpies. He's really drunk, and I'm a little bit buzzed. We sign her ass. Well, he gets drunk, and he only writes bid. He forgets to put his R on his, <laughs> on his name. Gets better. She comes back three months later at her next show, and somewhere nearby, and has it tattooed on her ass. Bid. Says bid no. and text. <laughs> And it was like the longest ass, too. It was like a <laughs> ass cheek. Oh, yeah. It was like a narrow one. Love you, though, sweetheart. Well, you did say uh, dedicated fans. <laughs> dedicated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.